Morphological types of languages. In this video, I'm going to be discussing a way of describing the world's languages according to how they use morphology. Specifically, we're going to be dividing languages into two types. There's analytic languages and there are synthetic languages. Within the synthetic languages, we'll see that there are further subtypes. Now, I think it's reasonable to think of this more as a continuum than anything else. Uh, that we've got analytic languages at one end, synthetic languages at another, and even within the synthetic and analytic languages, we may see some properties of some of these other types of languages. We'll start with analytic languages. These are languages that are made up largely of sequences of free morphemes. That is to say that relative to other languages, uh, most words are undecomposable, right? They're atomic. We can't separate them into smaller morphemes. That's not to say that there aren't affixes of, you know, for example, in English, which is considered an analytic languages, certainly we have plenty of prefixes and suffixes, but relatively speaking, there are a large number of free morphemes in the language. Mandarin Chinese might be an even better exemplar of analytic languages, where there are few bound morphemes in Chinese. Then we'll look at synthetic languages. These are made up largely of bound morphemes attached to other morphemes. That's not to say that there aren't free morphemes in these languages. It's just that, relatively speaking, relative to analytic languages, there are fewer of them. Um, Hungarian is a good example of a synthetic language as is Blackfoot. And in fact, they represent sort of extremes on that continuum within synthetic languages, where Hungarian is probably closer to analytic languages and Blackfoot is at the extreme of synthetic languages. So we'll start with the agglutinating languages. Again, these are the closest to the analytic languages. This, this is the case where many words, perhaps the majority of words, contain several morphemes but the morphemes are easily divided into roots and affixes. In other words, it's easy to tell where one morpheme ends and the next begins. It's kind of like you're just gluing these affixes onto the root, hence the name agglutinating. Hungarian is a very good example of this, as is Turkish. And I give you an example from Turkish of, of the villages. And we see that we've got our root here. And then we add to that root the plural and the genitive. And so each one, we can see where the morphemes begin and end. Fusional languages are kind of similar in that you've got plenty of bound morphemes, affixes attaching to stems. But the thing is, it's harder to distinguish morpheme boundaries as the morphemes have, in a sense, fused together. Romance languages are, are good examples of fusional languages, as are some of the Slavic languages like Russian. And so I've got an example here where we want to look at the final word, which is the feminine singular accusative of hand. And our root was probably that ru, and our affix is probably that ku. But the thing is that that ku has wrapped into it many different functions. When we look at the agglutinating languages, we would be able to separate all of those functions. So singular is going to have a different um, morpheme, say, from accusative. And so you could tell what was the accusative marker, what is the feminine marker, what's the singular marker, and so on. You can't do that in fusional languages. They're kind of all wrapped up into one complex morpheme. And then polysynthetic languages are going to be at the extreme end of synthetic languages. These are where highly complex words are formed of several bound morphemes. Uh, examples would be languages like Sora, Blackfoot, Shoshone. These are frequently the case in, in these languages where you may find very few free morphemes, where most morphemes are in fact 
bound morphemes. even the roots require an affix for it to count as a full-fledged word here's an example from blackfoot that i think is interesting so we've got our root the verb meaning to go home but that word can't stand by itself so it's not a word by itself it or that root is not a word by itself it needs these prefixes for it to stand so you've got the plural marker here and you've got the subject marker here creating this sentence i'm going home and in many of these polysynthetic languages you can find extraordinarily complex sentences that consist of a single word. 